Christ is risen, amen? Let's all stand and worship. Happy Easter. If you're watching with us online or you're watching here, this is the day we say that our Christ, our Lord, our God is risen. He defeated death. And as one church, as one voice, we're going to worship him today. Amen? Amen. amen. And cries out his name. Don't you let yourself be quiet today as we sing. That nations bow, mountains shake at the sound of just one name. Over all, Jesus reigns. I know, oh, I know. That's right. Nations bow, mountains shake at the sound of just one name. Over all, Jesus reigns. I know, oh Jesus, I know. King of glory, there is a God who saves, one who is strong and mighty, freedom is in his name, open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise, there is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. And there is a lion Jesus, the King of glory. Come on, church, everybody in here today. That's right, come on. Amen. Sorry about that. I think it's testing. There we go. We try again? Maybe. I'll stay away from that mic. We'll do good. Announcements that are important. The first one that goes up on the screen uh, is about our land, guys. Uh, no, not them. I want that one. There we go. Uh, you see how much we got left, guys? Isn't that awesome? We are, uh, we are getting her paid off, and so you be praying for that as we get this finished and then start on the building. And now, Mike, the other announcement that the ladies want to make, please let them do that. Hey, ladies. 
and everybody from Oakwood. This is your simulcast team. We've been planning and praying a lot about the function that we're having coming up, and we'd love to have everybody come. Ask your friends, ask your mothers, your daughters, your kids who would be interested in coming. We're going to be providing a delicious lunch for you to share and to fellowship with. Um, the deadline for registration is April 4th. Just go to oakwoodchurch.org and click on events to register. And if you need help registering, on Saturday and Sunday, we'll have a table set up in the lobby to stop by and we can help you. Amen. Amen. This uh, weekend is the last weekend to get registered for that, so please make sure you do. The reminder is on April the 17th when they do that, our services will start at 6 o'clock on Saturday evening instead of 5 o'clock. If you have asked Christ into your life recently, you need to get baptized. There is a list out there. We're baptizing April the 24th. And then last, um, OBC 401, a class about sharing your faith, is on April the 25th. We'd like you to get signed up for that. But the most important thing this weekend is the fact that we are celebrating reading Easter this weekend. Amen. Okay, good. Now we'll all start over again. You ready? The most important thing that we're celebrating this weekend is Easter. Amen. amen. How many of you are from churches where they never said amen in the church? How many of you from congregations was real quiet? Okay. So how many of you in your lifetime have become real quiet? How many of you are U of M fans? Raise your hand. How many of you are U of M fans? Michigan State fans? How many of you just hate football in general? Glory. Hallelujah. I learned a long time ago, if I am thrilled about something, I inform my face. Secondly, as a Christian, the Bible talks about that they literally had contests in the church on who could shout the loudest and say amen the loudest, because the word amen just means I agree. Colin, how you doing, buddy? Show everyone how to say amen. amen. All in favor that that sucked, say Amen. amen. Ah, okay. Colin, you want to try it again? Amen? Amen. Ah, that's getting a little better. <clears throat> He's being abused. His wife is pregnant and uh, going to have a baby, and so I understand that world. I love you guys with all of my... Yeah, you can clap. That's cool. Love you guys with all of my heart. Let's continue worshiping the Lord tonight, guys. Come on. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, if you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies, if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. Come on, sing this with me today. If you got pain, He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker If you need freedom If you need freedom For saving He's a prison shaking savior And you got chains He's a chain breaker Oh yeah oh, Now we've all searched for the light of day In the dead of night and we've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight and We've all run to things we know just ain't right But there's a better life Just there's a better life If you got pain, he's a pain taker mm. If you feel lost, he's a way maker if you need freedom for saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can't feel it, Somebody testify in here today. Somebody say amen. If you believe it, oh yeah. If you receive it, if you can feel it. Somebody testify in here today that you got no, you believe. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody. 
Somebody testify if he had pain. He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, we're saving. He's a prison shaking savior. You got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you need freedom, we're saving. He's a prison shaking savior. You got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you need freedom, if you need freedom or saving. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Give God his praise. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. Ain't that right? Man, it feels good just to stand here and worship with you guys and uh, just feel that freedom, to feel that hope. But you know what? Psalm 113.2 says, Blessed be the name of the Lord from right now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the setting of that sun, let his name be praised. You got to help me out on this one. See, I've searched the world. But it couldn't fill me In man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough But then you came along And put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied here in your love come on somebody lift your voice today oh there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you who is like the lord our god see i'm not afraid Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place. Your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Come on, don't be quiet. Don't be quiet. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You 
you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can oh yeah mm -hmm. you turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only Sing it. Oh, there's nothing, somebody. Oh, there's nothing, Jesus. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Jesus, oh, oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Come on, you take the next one, come on. Oh, there's Nothing is better than you. We give you praise. We give you praise, Jesus. You conquered death just for me, just for you, and everybody here. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross In darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand That's when death was arrested in my Yeah. 
my life began That's when death was arrested And my life began That's when death was arrested And my life began But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand That's when death was arrested and my life began Come on somebody make a shout out there today That's right Heavenly Father thank you so much That you as a people that you called us as a people for a time like this, for a place like this, for a moment like this in our lives that, that the world, the world is struggling, the world needs you more than it's ever needed you. And you have given us, you have blessed us. I know there's pain, I know there's hurt, I know there's doubts, I know there's darkness. But you have put us here in this time in our history to lead the way to lead the church, to lead your people, and to lead the lost back to you. And so give us the strength, give us the backbone, give us the power, give us the anointing, your Holy Spirit, to change this broken world. Jesus Christ came to seek and save that which is lost. And we owe it to you for dying on that cross, but then three days later, three days later rising up and somebody somebody somewhere has got to say amen to that that's right we serve a king who's alive and we love you lord and pray this in the matchless name that is above all names jesus christ we pray this in your name and all god's children said amen you may be seated church Don't you love being here today? Don't you love having a smile on your face and worshiping our God? i 
Right, amen. Happy Easter. Come on, Pastor. We set you up. You're ready, right? How's that not wake you up? Quick, <laughs> please. And whatever music they got going, everybody stand up with me, please. Who is your King, your Lord, and your Savior? Who is your King, your Lord, and your Savior? What did He do for you? Where would you be going if it wasn't for what he did for you? I want to know where you'd be going. When I said and joked earlier about, uh, um, and I didn't tell you to sit down, so don't sit yet. When I said and said earlier that we run into an issue with uh, um, an, an enemy that plays games, that looks at us and, and does everything in his power to get our attention off what it should be, Easter becomes the prevalent day that he does that. You can now have a seat. I titled this Freedom. People, everyone that's got kids in this society right now, would you raise your hand? You're raising little guys in this world. You do understand that most of your children have no idea and no perception of what the word freedom even means, correct? Correct? People that walk, that walk through and live through World War II, people that lived through World War I, um, Korean a little bit, Vietnam some, but a battle started in this country, and the battle that started was to get people off of the thought of understanding what they have. It's why we live in the culture that we live in today. And I don't know where your heart is, and I don't know what your thoughts are, but I know most of you in this room are big boys and big girls, and so you understand when we get together for Easter, there is a certain thing that all churches do. And every once in a while, people walk up to me and say, what are we doing for Easter? And I say the same thing I always say, hi. When I was a young man, I came to Jesus and I made him my Lord and Savior. Don't misunderstand what I'm getting ready to say. Make sure you get it. I made him my Lord and Savior. I don't need special places. I don't need special times. I don't need special times places, situations, anything to be excited about my God. I don't have to go to camp. Some of you grew up as Christians, you went to camp, and kids would go to camp and they'd get all geeked out and excited and thrilled and they'd come back and that would last about one week in their church and they'd be gone. I don't need any of that. I don't have to have high power music, I have to have none of it. I can sit in my office by myself and sob my eyes right out of my head. I can sit in my office and lift my hands up to my Savior and praise His name in a culture and a society that doesn't even understand that anymore. We read verses when it's a nice holiday for Ephesians 1, 7. He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with His blood of His Son and forgave our sins. If you don't understand what was forgiven for you, then you have no idea what I'm talking about. Someone was brutally executed two millennia ago. There's been a persistent argument that claims that the resurrection of Jesus Christ never took place. Why? Why do they claim that it never happened, the thing that proves his deity? And if you go, oh, wait, that, that's not true. Uh, Barna, which is somebody I like, their polls that they do, I, I, I pretty well trust them, found that almost 45% of adults living in America right now do not tie Easter to the resurrection. People in the 18 to 25 year old age group did the worst on it. Of it not even being something that's in their heads. How many of you know what took place 
at the crucifixion and at the resurrection. And I'm being serious when I ask that question. And so we're on the page together. After the Last Supper, Jesus went with his disciples to the Mount of Olives, to what we call the Garden of Gethsemane. And he prayed all night. Anticipating what was coming, he walked through a psychological stress issue that we call that condition hematidrosis. Most people have never even heard of it. But you see, when Jesus was alive, he walked down streets that just like we line our streets with telephone poles, they line their streets with people being crucified. In Rome regularly, in Jerusalem all the time, there was rebellion and there was revolts. Individuals were stuck on crosses, just like we would think of a lamp or a pole being on a street. We have glorified pictures of something and left out reality. When you see movies or pictures of Paul walking down the street at night, missing the fact that on the streets at night when Paul walked down the streets, they weren't lit up by lamps that produced light like that. They were lit up by Christians that had oil poured over them that were put in boxes and were set aflame. And when Jesus walked down the streets, he would go from one person to the next that had been crucified, and he knew what was coming. Hematidrosis causes such a severe anxiety in the body that it breaks the capillaries up in the sweat glands, and it literally makes you sweat blood. That's what was going on in his heart. When he was done praying, they were met in the garden by a group of individuals. Most things you see show 20 to 30 people. Scripture and history, not just Scripture, teaches that more than 600 men went to get him. And when he asked the question, or they asked the question about who he was, and he proclaimed who he was, 600 of them fell backwards. Something happened in that garden that was off the chart. That's never depicted in any movie you've ever watched. You always see the little thing where Judas walks up and kisses him on the cheek. You never see the thing that 600 people fell backwards. You never see the thing that one of the disciples picked up a sword and went to cut somebody's head off. The man ducked, he took his ear off, and Jesus walked over and picked the ear back up and stuck it on his head and healed him instantly. But he was betrayed in the garden. He was brought before the Sanhedrin in a secret trial. He was judged and found guilty, and he was brought before Pilate. He was brought before Pilate because Jews, in their situation, were not allowed to bring anyone to trial to execute him, and so they had to take him before Pilate. They argued the merits of why he needed to be executed. Jesus looked down into the face, or Pilate looked down into the face of Jesus and said, are you king of the Jews? And he said, you have said it, which means yes. For the rest of the charges, Jesus never said a word. Pilate got bothered, realized the game that was being played. And he looked at all of them thinking he would play one card. This is an innocent man. You certainly don't want to kill an innocent man. So I give you a choice. Every Passover, we free somebody. And they screamed, give us Barabbas, a notorious murdering animal. Pilate shook his head, lifted his hand, and they started the process. Guards pulled Jesus off, walked him into a little courtyard. Sorry, if it deals with your feelings roughly. They walked him up to a pole. They chained his hands to the pole. They pulled his feet back. They stripped him completely naked. And they pulled a whip out. 
The whip was called the cat of nine tails. It was a leather thong that hung down, and inside of it were round balls of metal, pieces of bone, and glass. They gave him 39 lashes. Scripture calls it 40 minus 1. And if you've read, never read that and never understood why they said it, it was because it was Roman tradition that if a man was given a death sentence, you ought to be able to kill him in 40 lashes. If you couldn't, you as a Roman soldier ran the risk of being executed for not being able to do that. They would take the whip, strap it on the body, lock it in place, and rip it back off. The metal balls caused deep bruises or contusions. The bones and glass would cut the flesh so severely that most of the time the body was so shredded that part of the spine was exposed. The whipping went from the shoulders, down the back, across the buttocks, and down the legs. The lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and literally produce quivering ribbons of hanging flesh. And because they would whip them one way and walk around and whip them the other way, the joy for the Roman soldiers was watching square pieces of flesh fall off their bodies. Their veins were laid bare, their muscles and sinews and the bowels from victims were exposed when they were done. And most people never lived to get to the cross. If they did, they experienced such pain and such loss of blood that they produced, they walked into something called hypovolemic shock. And if you are a former police officer or nurse or doctor who worked in an emergency ward, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Cops see it all the time in car wrecks. The heart starts racing, trying to pump blood that's not there. The blood pressure drops as they start fainting. Kidneys stop producing urine to maintain the flow that it's going through the body that very little is there. And because every organ is sucking every ounce of blood and liquid it can get, they become so thirsty they can't think straight. And cop after nurse sitting in this room will talk to you about people sitting in emergency wards and cars begging for a drink of water. Did Jesus experience this? Yeah. When he walked up the Via Dolorosa, the path to the cross, and when he said on the cross, I am thirsty. When they were done beating him and laughing and making fun of him, they walked him into the governor's soldier's courtyard. They took thorns and weaved them into a crown and trying to get it on his head, couldn't quite get it there, so they took a stick and they began to jam it down his head. They covered him in a scarlet robe and they put this stick in his hand and they begin to bow before him and pretend like they were worshiping him. When they got done with their fun, they walked him back before the Jews, the Pharisees, the high priests, and the Sanhedrin, wearing the robe and the crown. And they stood there looking at him and screamed, crucify him. He stood there long enough that the robe dried into the open wounds. They ripped it off of his body. They placed the pantabulum, which is the crossbar, across his shoulders that weighed 80 to 100 pounds, and they started walking him down the Via Dolorosa to the place of the skull that we call Calvary or Golgotha. He was laid on a horizontal beam one soldier tied a rope around his wrist, one held the other hand, and they pulled his arm six inches further than normal, which the majority of the time pulled him out of joint. They put a nail through this part of the hand that we call the palm, that in the Greek was just looked at as the hand. And if you look at x-rays, you'll see that the nail did not break a bone from where they put it in. But what's sad and interesting about where they learned to put it, it's in the middle of the median nerve. And if you want to know what kind of pain he went through, if you've ever hit your elbow on anything, we call it the funny bone. 
Every single time Jesus moved to breathe, that's the exact pain he felt. It was like taking pliers and crushing a nerve. The beam was hoisted into place. It was put on what's called the stripes crucis, the way of the cross. It was wedged into its place and hanging there. They took a hammer and a nail and they drove it into his feet. Something you'll enjoy in the proper way of enjoying. Every picture you've ever seen of Jesus being crucified, they took the nail and they drove it through his foot, correct? And that's not where the nail was. You see, they've dug up hundreds upon hundreds of bodies that the Roman soldiers crucified. No nail was ever put through the top of the foot. Every nail was always put in the heel and driven through the bone. Because if you put it in the foot, it couldn't push to breathe. You put it in the heel because they could jam it so they could go up. But you want to know what's powerful about that? In Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says that God looked at Satan and said, you will bruise his heel and he will crush your head. You know what Golgotha means? It means the place of the skull. Do you know what Calvary means in Greek? It's cranium. Cranium. Skull. You bruised his heel. He crushed your head when they dropped him into that hill. On a cross, crucifixion is essentially dying by asphyxiation. You push up to breathe, you go down to let it out. The pain was so unbearable and so known for being unbearable that no Roman citizen was allowed to have it done to them unless they were the highest form of a traitor. The pain was so excruciating that they made up the word excruciating that we use in our culture when someone is burnt severely. But if you go look up the word, it's Latin and it means out of the cross. Wooden cross, back ripped to shreds, up and down to breathe. And eventually reaches the point that he's so tired that he can't hardly move. And the body goes into something called respiratory acidosis. That's where the carbon dioxide in the blood dissolves into carbonic acid and it causes the acidity level to reach such a level that the heart starts beating so irregular that Jesus knew he was getting ready to die. And it's why he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. When acidosis takes place, the heart forms liquid around it and the lungs form liquid around them. It's an effusion takes place there. Why am I telling you this horrific, horrible story on this day? Two reasons. One, if we don't understand that we as humans are sinners and we need God, then what he did on the cross means nothing. It doesn't make sense. It's illogical. And yet in our culture, if I stand up and say, I'm a sinner, I'm, I'm, I'm lost without God, I'll go to hell, what he did makes perfect sense. Because what he did on the cross was not just dying in Frank's place, he substituted for Frank. So our culture that doesn't appreciate that went, there's got to be a way to fix this. And so there was. They came up with a theory. It's called the swoon theory. Raise your hand if you ever heard of the swoon theory. Okay. You ready? Jesus didn't die. It's taught in major universities all over America. It's taught in churches all over America. That what happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he said, I thirst, and a guy took a goblet and stuck it up to him, and he took a drink out of it, and there was a drug in it that slowed his heart rate 
down so much that the soldiers thought he was dead. It was announced to Pilate that he was dead. Pilate was surprised he died that quick. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, and the high priest standing there said, we're getting ready to go into the Passover. We want him off the cross. Get the process going that he dies. If you don't know what they did when they wanted the process to go on, the Roman soldier walked over, picked up a club, walked up to the guy that was on the cross, and because you're going up and down to breathe, turned around and smashed one knee, went on the other side, smashed the other knee, both legs are now broken, you go down, and it takes roughly about two to two and a half minutes for you to finally lay there and die. He did it to both on both sides, walked up to Jesus and looked at him and got ready to swing, and one of the guys went, whoa, stop, he's dead. And don't give me the bit that they weren't contemporary and modern so they wouldn't understand death. Roman soldiers were bred to understand death. And one of them said, he's dead already. Back then when this got said, they had no idea what they were talking about. One soldier picked up a spear, walked up and looked at Jesus and jammed it into his side through a rib and up into his heart. And when he pulled it out, blood and water came from his body. Don't let sentimentality make you go, oh, that's that old thing that he died from a broken heart. It has nothing to do with it. Even though I know his heart was broken, it was the pain that his body went through for you that destroyed his heart, his lungs, and his breathing. Liquid built up around those things. And when they stuck it in and pulled it out, John says that blood and water came from him. And every modern contemporary scientist goes, see, that way we know it's not real. If it's real, water would have come first instead of blood. No, the kick is they're scientists. They're not Greek scholars. When they write something in Greek, it's whatever the amount is, is the biggest, is the first word that is said. What came from his body was water and blood, but because most of it was blood, John said blood and water came, and he didn't even understand that what he was telling you was the guy on the cross was dead. But if it was the swoon theory, they stuck him in a borrowed tomb. It was cold. They laid him in there. His body revived, and joy among joy, a man that had nails going through his heels walked out of a tomb, dislocated shoulders, rolled a stone away, went past guards, and walked up to his guys and said, I'm alive, I've risen from the dead. I want to know how many of you that would inspire. See, if you read all the accounts of what happened, ladies, I'm sorry, if you read all of the accounts of what happened, it always involves a group of women. How many of you have ever noticed that? Okay. See, most ladies will go, well, of course, men don't know how to tell the truth. It's only women that are going to tell the truth. Okay, I'll give you that. But in a legal system back then, women weren't allowed to testify. They didn't count their word. And if you ever want to understand something that is just sheer truth, it's somebody sitting down and saying that I've got to tell you exactly what took place. And exactly what took place was a group of women walking into a situation that the story became so insane that John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all of the guys couldn't even deal with the story the way it was because there were so many things that were said. But what we do get this was, they used a woman to testify to what was happened. That means it was the truth, even though it was illogical that they were using a lady to say it. Does that make sense to everybody? And the biggie? Biggie, he rose from the dead. He walked out of the tomb, whole and complete, and he walked into his disciples and he looked at his disciples and said, I am risen. And you want proof? Full grown men left there, told everyone, and so no one can ever play the game with you. They stood there telling people, he is risen, where people could just simply go to the graveyard and do what? You want proof? 
They took one disciple, they laid his body across a rock, they took a blade and slowly sawed him in half. They took another disciple and stood there with arrows, just filling his body with arrows. They crucified one upside down. They beheaded another one. They killed every disciple except John. Every single one of them screaming the same thing. He is risen from the dead! And that message changed Frank. Does that make sense to everybody? How it changed Frank? This is important. Hi, we're free. I don't have to, number one, in your notes, have guilt over my past anymore. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. Why is the old life gone and the new life started? Please listen. Please don't miss this. So, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Please, please hear this. Some of you have been raised in church so long, and you have heard the religious garbage so long about everything you have to do and how you have to live a certain life, and you've got to be a good person. And how many of you have ever noticed that one good person compared to another good person really doesn't know how good the other person is good-wise? Does that make sense? We run around judging what's good. How many of you are actually good? I want to know. How many of you in this room are actually good? Anyone cuss today? Anyone feel like cussing today? Okay, I got at least two in the room. Anyone get yelled at by your wife, and when you were getting yelled at by your wife, you weren't exactly thinking good thoughts when she was yelling at you? We live in a world of human beings trying to say, I'm good, I'm great, I'm fine, I'm okay, when we're told by God that the only standard that I accept is perfection. I can't be perfect. And you being raised in church all of your life, listening to people say, if you just go to church, if you just follow the rules, if you just tithe, if you just do these things, you'll be good. And what that goodness is going to get you is hell. That's what Easter's all about. A Savior that died on a cross. So that this means that anyone who belongs to Christ, that person is a new person. The old life is gone. They've become a new person. Why? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For God made Christ who never sinned, underline the part who never sinned. He never sinned to be the offering for our sin, the penalty for me, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. I have been forgiven. He was the substitute for me. I don't have to live in guilt. And every one of you understand what guilt is. It robs you of your happiness. It causes depression. I'm sorry, please hear me out. It robs you of your happiness. It causes depression. It makes you physically sick. For some of you, it's living in a beer bottle. For some of you, it's putting a needle in your arm and taking drugs because you can't get the voice in your head to stop. And you've spent a lifetime trying to get it to change, and it won't change because you won't do what you need to do. And I'm not saying that you've got to be this or you've got to be that because if it's any of that, I'm in trouble. No, what's needed is something called a clear conscience. A clear conscience is an individual that comes before a holy God and says, forgive me, that says, I am a piece of garbage. I, I sin naturally. It's what I do. I, I've, I, I've never been able to keep myself being right and being what I'm supposed to be. Would you please, for, please, please, would you please forgive me? And Colossians 2.14 says, He canceled the record of the charges against us, and He took it away by nailing it to the cross. I don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. I don't have to follow rules to go to heaven. I don't have to give my money to go to heaven. I do all those things because I love God. Does that make sense? I don't have to play the game of Frank being good enough because if Frank's good enough, your religious garbage of living in the world of a making yourself better, doing things better, being a better husband, doing all this other stuff isn't going to get you anywhere because you're still going to stand before God and he's still going to look at you and say, you're a sinner. What changed it is the record of charges against Frank got wiped out by what Jesus did. He became sin for me. He rose from the grave. He conquered death. He got rid of everything. He didn't come to make me good. He came to make me alive. I'm radically 
different. I don't have to live in guilt. I don't have to walk around feeling horrible. I don't have to do that. And number two, because of what he did for me, I don't have to worry about the future. I don't have to walk around fretting and being upset and being bothered and wonder how I'm going to live and how I'm going to do. I love Philippians 4, 6 through 8. It's simple, but, but listen. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Please underline this. It'll change your life. Don't worry about anything. How many of you are professional worry warts? Raise your hand. All the professional worry warts. Don't lie. Don't sit in the service and go, well, it's not me. Raise your hand. Professional worry warts. Okay, question. It's, just, it's, it's a simple one. Does it get you anything? Do you win any battles being a worry ward? Does it change anything? Every one of you that worry yourself sick over what your little guys are going to do and what's going to happen to them, i got bad news for you. They're going to turn 16, get in a car, and drive out of your yard, and you can't protect them. You can't sit in the back seat driving with them and be in there for them. They're going to be gone. The day, April 8, Easter 2012, the event... Colorado Springs annual Easter egg hunt. The calamitous situation that took place. They had to cancel the event. Why? They stood on bullhorns yelling for the parents to get out of the roped-in areas because children were going to get trampled. The reason why the parents wouldn't get out of the areas is because they had to make sure that Jimmy was going to get the amount of eggs that he was supposed to so Jimmy wouldn't be psychologically damaged for the rest of his life. How many of you ever went Easter egg hunting and got one egg because the little fat kid knocked you over and set on you? How many of you ever happened in your life? Are you ruined for the rest of your days? I watched the kids doing Easter egg hunts out there. There was some phenomenal kids out there. Lightning fast, grabbing eggs here, grabbing eggs there, eating them while they went, bringing them to their daddy. I watched him eat so many eggs, it was pathetic with his children out there. He was quick though. He'd pull it out, eat it, put the paper back in, and put the thing in the bag. I've been to thousands of Easter egg hunts, and you go, thousands? Yep, mm -hmm. I'm a pastor. Got to go to one here, one there, one there. But I've been to so many. My favorite Easter egg hunt of all time, we were at church. It was awesome. We had 700 kids lined up on a line, ready to go. We were out in the country. You could shoot guns back then. We were in an area where you could do that. They were ready to fire the gun. As they got ready to fire the gun, one of the gentlemen in our church named Buford walked up, grabbed the microphone, and said, I just want to let all y'all kids know there's 10 eggs out there that's got a $100 bill in them. Would you like to guess how intense the parents got about the Easter egg hunt? <laughs> Some little kid got two. I've never seen fistfights at Easter egg hunts. They were tearing the place up. My point, I have a God who looks at me and says, Frank, I loved you so much I died for you. And you can worry yourself to death. And it ain't going to help anything. I'm in charge, and I love you, and I care for you, and because of the cross, Frank, there is no weapon of disease out there that has the power to prevail against you, including the coronavirus. I decide when you go home. I say it all the time. It gets me freaked out how many Christians I meet are just worried sick about getting in an airplane because they might crash and they might die. You do realize that God doesn't need an airplane to kill you? He can just drop the plane right in the middle of your house. And if you want to have fun, if any of you sitting in this room are ever in a plane that's going down, just so you'll know, it goes down at 600 miles an hour. While it's going down and you're pinned to the back wall because you took your seatbelt off, you're pinned to the back wall. Be yelling while you're pinned to the wall. If y'all were to die right now, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? Everyone on the plane will get saved, amen? amen. Imagine standing in heaven with 150 other people that all look at you and go, I got saved right before we hit the ground. Glory. You go, you have a demented view of life. I don't worry about the disease because I don't worry about dying. I'll spend eternity in heaven for eternity with my God. And, and yeah, you can laugh at me. You can look at me and go, oh yeah, that's just all that religious stuff made up in your mind. No, it's not religious stuff. It's a Savior that died on the cross. I'm not religious. 
Tell God what you need. Thank Him for all He's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts, your minds, as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what's true, honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Everyone who understands it, say amen. Cool. Number three, because we did on the cross, I am free to live without the garbage that straps up life. So I get to be living without a purpose or with a purpose. I get to choose. When it says in my notes, living without a purpose, don't miss it. I get to go through life being the things God wants me to be. We are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. The good things. I love life. I enjoy it. I love laughing. I love picking. For those of you that have been around me as a pastor any length of time at all, I have a sense of humor and I love sloshing it on people. If I don't pick on you, I don't love you. If you're not picked on, now you understand why. I harass every person I meet. I met Gracie. She was brand new walking in tonight, and I immediately started picking on her. Why? Because she's dating a really weird guy. I enjoy life. I enjoy laughing and cutting up. I enjoy watching football. I enjoy all the things that make up this world. But that's not why I exist. I exist to share my faith with people. C.S. Lewis said the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ to make them little Christ. If they're not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose than to save mankind. I like Acts 20.24 says, My life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for the finishing work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. I listen all the time to people talking about the world we're living in right now. People are scared and people need Jesus. And when people look at me and say, what you're doing is the church is insane, it's not a good witness, Jesus would have practiced social distancing, Jesus would have wore a mask, bull. Jesus touched lepers, guys. And I respect people. I have no problem with any of that. But what's happened to the church during this pandemic, we fold it into little boxes and the world is going to hell without God because we're not telling them. And we're playing the game that, well, if we can just put it on the screen, they'll watch it online. I got news for you. People that don't go to church don't watch much online programs from churches. Most preachers put people to sleep, guys. Why is it so important that we understand our job is to share the gospel? It's because God has the answer, not government. The Savior has the answer, not science. And the ruler has the answer, not the rules that we try to live by. You see, apart from the gospel, there is no changed life. Does that make sense? I, I, I went through a battle like some of you are going through right now. So I'd like to finish with saying it this way tonight. My Savior died a horrific death. I don't do that a lot in messages, but I did it on this day because the death that he died put him in a grave. And when he rose out of that grave, he conquered sin and he conquered death. So that Frank knows that Frank doesn't have to spend eternity in hell without God. But this is where the kick comes in. The kick goes like this. You got raised in church. Church taught you all your life. You got to be good. You got to follow rules. And you got to act a certain way. And that's not the truth. I have no problem with saying I'm supposed to live a certain life. I live a life. I live a life for my Savior because I'm in love with Him, not because it's going to get me His love. 
Does that make sense? There is nothing as hideous as being a child and having to get mommy and daddy to love you by performing and doing what you're supposed to do so they'll love you by making the best grades or being the best in sports. You tried that. It's not love. Love is when a parent looks at you and says, Jimmy, I don't care if you can't throw the football. I don't care if you're not the smartest kid in the class. I don't care if you're not the prettiest. I love you just like you are. I have a God that looks at me and says, Frank, you don't have to be the most religious. You're allowed to say damn it when you get ticked off. How many of you are allowed to say damn it? How many of you freak out in church hearing a Baptist preacher go, you're allowed to say damn it? <laughs> and see, that's what's hysterical. We go to church and we go, I am holy, 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 amen, and it's all bull. And you go, you're making fun. You're dang right I'm making fun. Because I'm a human. I'm a screw up. We do it naturally. Every guy in this room that's married, say amen. amen. Does she remind you you're a screw up? Amen. It's just sitting down and saying I'm me. And this God looked at me, Frank, and said, son, you're not perfect. You'll never be perfect. I made room for your imperfection because I, God, look at you and say, you're a screw-up. And I know it. But I love you so much that he, the enemy, wants your head and wants you dead. And I stood in the way. And I became the substitute for you. And I took it. And being free means, Frank, you don't have to earn it. Being free is having to not deal with that. So I'm able to not have to worry about earning my way into heaven. The Bible says in Romans 4, 4 through 5, listen as I close. But he didn't earn his right to heaven by doing all the good things he did. No. Being saved is a gift. If a person could earn it by being good, it wouldn't be free. But it is. It's given to those who do not work for it. For God declares sinners to be good in his sight if they have faith in Christ to save them from God's wrath. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So none of us can boast about it. I meet people in their 20s and 30s and 40s all the time that look at me and say, if that's true, explain to me why I've never been able to get free and feel like I'm okay. And I'm sorry, the answer back is simplistic. is because you've never truly accepted the forgiveness that was given to you. Tonight, accept it. Quit trying to ride the horse that ain't getting you anywhere. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. The free gift of eternal life is through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10, 9 through 13 says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. If you openly declare, not if you do works, not if you do all this other stuff, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart God had raised him from the dead, you'll be saved because it's believe in your heart that you're made right with God. It is by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. All the scriptures tell us that anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew or Gentile. Everyone in this room that's a Jew, raise your hand. Okay, so everybody's Gentiles. Jew or Gentile, you're all the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what Easter's all about. Me calling on God. I'd like to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes with me if you would. And I'd just like to ask you tonight, if you were to die this evening, 
If tonight was the night you left this world, do you know where you'd spend eternity? Do you know where you'd go? And if you say, I've spent my whole life trying to be religious, I've spent my whole life trying to follow rules, I've spent my whole life fighting and bickering and going back and forth, Jesus Christ said, I came to die on the cross for you, and all you have to do is accept it. Keeping of the law means nothing. The law was given in the Old Testament just to show us we were sinners. Salvation is by grace. Living the Christian life is by grace. It's not by works. And it's not by me following rules. I do what I do because I'm in love with my Savior. I go to church. I live for him. I give. I do all of that because of love, not because it's going to make him love me. He said, Frank, all you have to do is believe and ask ask me into your life. And if you're sitting here tonight and you've listened to everything I've said and there's a part of you that says, I understand what he did and I need that in my life. I need Jesus in me. I need him changing me. Then right where you're sitting, pray this prayer. Just inside, just say, Dear Lord, please forgive me of my sins. I believe you died for me. Tell him that. I believe you were buried for me, and I believe you rose again for me. Come into my life today. I make you my Lord, and I make you my Savior. Please change my world, and I ask this in your name. With no one looking around, if you prayed that prayer, and you meant business with it. You were sincere. He said he saved you. He says he gives you a home in heaven and he'll change your life for eternity. And all I'd like to ask you to do, I want to ask you to get up and come forward or any of that. I just want to ask you, if you prayed that prayer and you meant business with it, you were sincere, that's what he told us to do. If you did that and you prayed that prayer, would you just look up here at me? I don't want you to worry about what another human being is doing in this room between you, me, and God. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, man. Got you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate that. You can look down now. Thank you. Father, take what those individuals just did and change their life forever. Use it in their world to give them that strength to walk without guilt to not worry about the future, to understand they have a purpose, and to know that our salvation is by grace, not by works. We love you, Lord. And we ask this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Zach? Whatever you do to find your peace, if it's you just sitting here with your eyes closed and praying and giving God some thanks, just thank Him for the cross. Thank Him that you're still alive, still breathing. Thank you that when He was on that cross, He thought of you. When He was on that cross, He thought of me. If you want to stand, if you want to lift your hands, if you want to lift your voice, don't walk out of here today without giving praise to Him. Because He loves you. I hope you heard that. He loves you. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed of sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself Do you thirst from a drink from the well Jesus is calling out your name today 
Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling oh yeah oh yeah bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life was born Jesus is calling and oh come to the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness Precious blood of Jesus Christ. What a Savior. Sing Alleluia. And oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. And bow down before him. Before he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen, Christ is risen, Christ is risen, and no one has said Come on, church! Oh, isn't he wonderful? Oh, sing hallelujah! Christ is risen! We will bow down, we will bow down, bow down before. Before he is the Lord of all, let's sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. And all oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgive me. blood of Jesus Christ will oh, come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ of Jesus Christ cross as you wait for a crown tell the world of the treasure you found bear your cross as you wait for your crown tell the world of the treasure you We rejoice, you're the Lord of all creation, our Jesus, our 
Jesus. Oh, oh, mm. And oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. One more. And oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Come on, church, everybody in here. Let's go. Let's hear it. Let's hear it for the King. You ain't clapping for me. You ain't clapping for me. You've got some praise today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for conquering death. Thank you, Jesus, for thinking of us when you were on that cross. And then thank you for thinking of us when you kicked that tomb wide open and stepped out of that grave at King. We love you and pray this in your name and all God's children said, amen. Happy Easter. Don't forget that when you walk out of here, we can take pictures out in the youth center. So you go right down the hall. You can talk out in the lobby, but go love somebody and tell them about the Jesus we serve. Happy Easter. You are dismissed.